Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the in-house podcast from Narrative House. This is our space where we discuss issues at the intersection of Muslim identity, popular culture and Islam. Today it's our privilege to be joined by our brother Moazem Beg. Moazem is the outreach director of the international advocacy group CAGE. He's a former Guantanamo Bay detainee and he's the author of Enemy Combatant. So without further ado, brother Moazem, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So I'm going to jump straight into it, both feet in. Today we're talking about courage (laughs) and I wanted to ask you what is the single most courageous thing that you have ever seen? Um, (coughs) I don't know if I could say this on camera but I think uh, I've seen a person in front of me walk into a minefield I've seen that person's leg literally blown off. But the most courageous thing I've seen is somebody walking into that minefield and picking up that person and carrying him uh, on his shoulders into a place of safety. That's the most courageous thing I've ever seen. What was the context around that? This was in Afghanistan in around 2001. Um, it was an area where we didn't know it was there was mines there, but a person that was in front of me had literally walked onto that mine and I thought that perhaps I might be next. What do you think inside steals someone enough to be able to take those steps into a literal minefield knowing that one of the almost certain outcomes is death? Uh, I think it's just the lack of being uh, personally invested into your own self so you're no longer considering yourself anymore you're considering somebody else and that goes to me beyond the word of courage or bravery and so forth it's simply that you care about somebody so much the other person so much uh, that whatever happens to you then becomes an afterthought so you think courage necessarily involves a disassociation from your selfhood at times certainly yes so for the believer what do you think courage means within the spiritual priorities of a muslim it's when you're prepared to do something regardless of or knowing in spite of the consequences so speaking a word of truth and that's why the prophet ﷺ said afdal jihad kalimatu haqq and the sultan in ja'ir the best jihad is speaking a word of truth in front of an oppressive ruler and this is really important because there's another hadith that mentions that uh, the, the Sayyid or the master of the martyrs is Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and the person who spoke against an uh, oppressive ruler, he enjoined good upon him, forbade evil upon him and was killed as a result. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was killed in a battlefield. Mm-hmm. Yet this person in this hadith is somebody who's simply enjoining good and forbidding evil but against power. Mm-hmm. So a little a small person uh, takes takes a word of truth mm. and presents it against power that is a supreme act of courage for which you know at least in the battlefield you can defend yourself with a sword or yes. with a shield but here you can't and so in an islamic context that's what that is the supreme act of of bravery of courage what you've just described there to me sounds like different faces of courage so you have the <coughs> you know the the warrior standing in the battlefield and knowing that this is the you know fight to the death and you have somebody standing in the court of the powerful willing to pay the price for saying what they do so when it comes to different aspects of courage how would you kind of classify intellectual courage, military courage, personal courage, where where do you see those distinctions? Yeah, of course, I mean, uh, the, the hadith, we're going back to the hadith, tells us you know, the master of the martyrs, the, the greatest sacrifice mm-hmm. was Hamza in the yes. battlefield. And yet he's totally equated with a person who speaks a word of truth. So courage isn't necessarily about putting your life at risk, but it is doing or saying something after all, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said that whoever from amongst you sees an evil, mm. let him sp- let him change it with his hand, first of all. If he's unable to do that, to speak out against him. If he's unable to do that, then to hate it in his heart. And that's the l- that's the weakest yes. 
uh, uh, weakest of faith. Mm. So the two acts, physically changing something with your hand if mm. you're able to do so, and speaking out against it, both against, an, against evil, uh, both require courage and are uh, uh, essentially, as, as Muslims, that's part of why we're here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you are the kuntum uh, khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas you were the best nation created for mankind, ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhuna anil munkar, that you enjoy good and forbid, forbid evil. And that's also a dis- very distinctive um, part of our faith, that if we see something, we try to change it, even as a, not as police officers, not as officers of the state, or, but just as ordinary citizens who um, are sent as, as part of Allah's message and the Prophet guidance to bring good to this world. So you talk about just everyday people, everyday believers. So what are the sources of courage? Where, where, where do you think that courage is drawn from? If it is something that, you know, is, is not just innate within, you know, a certain person's temperament or, you know, you even have whole nations where they're characterized as brave warriors or courageous like people. Where do you think the essence of courage really comes from? I just want to take the example of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Most people know him of as as a, a, a commentator of the Quran, memorizer of the Hadith and so forth, one of the greatest companions. But he was known at the time when Islam first w- w- was kind of building up. Uh, Abu Jahl used to call him, you little shepherd boy. Mm. Used to make fun of his legs mm. because they were thin. And, and uh, uh, this weak, poor man, almost, almost at the status of a slave, in fact, he's surrounded by people like Hamza, mm-hmm. Umar ibn Khattab, mm-hmm. Zubair ibn Awan, mm-hmm. these people who are strong. Giant. And so mm-hmm. in, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of s- teaching us in the Battle of Badr, where you've mm-hmm. got 313 fighting over a thousand, mm-hmm. who is it that delivers the final blow against Abu Jahl, mm-hmm. the Pharaoh of the Ummah? Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Masood. So this, and later on throughout history, he's not really known as a mm-hmm. fighter. Mm-hmm. So this essentially weak person has become strong because of those around him. Sohba, in Arabic they call it, you know, the companionship. Yes. So. Essentially, where does this come from? Is it learned? Can courage be learned? Yes. It can be learned. It can be. Uh, there are people who are intrinsically by themselves courageous, not just because um, uh, people around them, because it's in their, it's mm. kind of in their DNA. Mm-hmm. But there are people who, their parents, at home, uh, friends, family, and most importantly, surroundings, courage breeds courage, and the opposite is also true. Yes, because cowardice, cowardice and weakness breeds the same. So do you feel like it's a combination of the in- intrinsic kind of disposition of a person? Because you do see this in children. If you observe any standard playground kind of spat between children, you'll have one that really stands up for the one being picked on and the one being kind of abused or, or left out of the game or things. And you have the, you know, the archetypes of all these personalities are really evident even from a young age in people. Um, in terms of kind of, um, you know, a, a divine gift, if you will, like courage can can evidence itself in people. But for those who would like to strengthen and, and draw and feel kind of more courageous, where do you think the sources of that are? Uh, there are? There are obviously, uh, when you're young, there are uh, many different sources, primarily your, your home, your father. For example, my father used to tell me often, and as I was, I was growing up, I, I started to encounter neo-Nazi skinheads, mm. especially in my teens. Um, and I had been beaten by them. And generally, it was understood that, you know, you try to keep your head down mm. and keep away from trouble. Mm. But the trouble kept on coming, so we had to learn to fight back. I wasn't naturally somebody who wanted to get into fights, but I had to, to survive, and so did many people around me. And so that's, that's part of it. My father, although he was a, you know, a, a banker and so forth didn't want to get in his yes. kids getting involved in any trouble told me that as a as a kid he would always stand up for people who are getting bullied so he'd mm-hmm. get into physical fights mm-hmm. back home in pakistan he'd get into fights and he'd tell me he, he never once told me off for getting in a fight with skinheads not a single time uh, he once took me completely my, my entire body covered in blood from head to toe to the accent hospital but he never said don't get involved in that. He said, stand up for yourself. He was, n- was never, um, 
he never made me feel like I'd done something wrong. Yes. There was a kind of tacit acceptance yeah. of the fact it was a just fight. He understood he understood what we were facing. He understood. I want to talk to you about something, a conversation we actually had a few months ago, um, where we spoke about the general climate around kind of um, growing up, the, f the kind of messaging you hear in popular culture around various issues in the world when it comes to injustice and kind of standing up and being brave and setting the world to rights. You mentioned a certain... British reggae group of the 1980s, should we say, um, that actually were kind of a, a bit of a catalyst in getting you to think about these like wider concepts. Um, can you tell me a bit more? Yeah, about so uh, this was UB40. Um, they lived not, too, some of the lead singers lived not too far away from me and went to the same school, although they were they're older. They're Brummies, right? They're yeah, they're all Brummies, yeah, from right. Birmingham. Yeah. Um, and their lyrics in the the early lyrics of the first album were very conscious lyrics. Yes. Uh, they were singing about Martin Luther King. There was a famous one, I am a one in ten, a number on a list. I am a one in ten, even though I don't exist. Nobody knows it, but I'm always there. A statistic, a reminder of a world that doesn't care. Mm. And they're singing about an orphan. Now, as I started to practice Islam, I began to learn so much of how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts emphasis on the orphans, Prophet mm -hmm. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Yes. Yes, but yes. these guys are thinking about orphans in a way that really wasn't you know, the norm. Yeah, it wouldn't be commercially r rewardable, you no. wouldn't assume, right? You wouldn't think so, but no. they were, I think it's, uh, at that period of time, there were a lot of kind of uh, part of the culture, mm -hmm. people beginning to address things around the world. Uh, the nuclear arms race, that's another one they, they sang about. Martin Luther King. There's a fa yes. famous one they had about King. Where are your people now? Your where are your dreams now? Yes, about yes, all the exactly. we are. We all. I have a dream. Mm -hmm. Well, your dreams mm -hmm. like it's it's a nightmare for mm -hmm. people in in, mm -hmm. in America. Yeah, it's interesting actually because you know on the one hand it's really tempting to be kind of dismissive of the the messaging that is around in mainstream culture or pop culture and things like that, <coughs> but. Um, it, it seemed like once upon a time there was a climate where kind of, um, you know, ideas around war and injustice and poverty and third world debt and things like that were much more in the social consciousness. And even, you know, even musicians and, um, you know, lyrics and, uh, you know, pop culture were making these ideas much more kind of mainstream for for the public do you do you feel like there has been kind of a um a simpering down of that um i think in a sense uh, there's a lot more of everything now yeah just because yeah. It's just it's yeah. bigger numbers yeah. uh, for me I, I left a lot of that regardless of whether it was conscious or, or not yeah, yeah. Um, yeah when i started practicing Islam. of course yeah um, but there's always you always make reference to it you, whenever you hear something like that yeah. you, you kind of remember yourself at that time yes and what were you thinking and did it did that listening to that did that uh you know take you to yes. the journey of, yes. of becoming a practicing yes. muslim and I'd, yeah. I'd say the part of it did yes yeah i think you know fighting against the skinheads uh, searching for identity were well, my pakistani am i am mm. i british am i asian all of that led me to well i'm, I'm comfortable as a muslim um, and things like some of these conscious lyrics, I think subconsciously they were definitely directing me into, into a, you know, Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah din bi rajulin fajr. Allah will come to the aid of this religion, even with somebody who's rebellious to Allah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I see uh, that some of that is, is part of that. Yeah, and it's actually really interesting because, um, you know, it's ironic to think, you know, this uh, reggae group <coughs> of the 80s <laughs> is something that can inspire kind of right. a really deep rooted sense of discontent with the world. Because um, when I look back to being very young in, in primary school, I remember, um, you know, like Heal the World, Michael Jackson, where they had like, the footage of that would be like, you know, the Berlin Wall coming down and like a, a small child giving like a rose to like a soldier. And then there was like, you know, Bob Geldof and Live mm. Aid and this thing of poverty. And well, I remember from, you know, from, from, from is it, yeah, Live Aid, there, there's this one part and it's, it's in that song, which it kind of makes everybody stop. And it's, they're singing about the, the, uh, the famine in Ethiopia. Yes. And then he says, uh, I think it's Bob Geldof himself who says, and tonight, 
Thank God it's them instead, instead, instead of, of you. Yeah. And that's the point at which, wow, yeah. now you realize who you are yes. and how privileged you are. But it also reminded me of a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, whenever you see a people afflicted by mm. something, praise Allah yes. that you were not afflicted. Mm. And so the context is like, it, the message is similar, yes, but the context yes. is here, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes. that you're not in that state. Yeah. And what did he say tonight? Thank God it's God them said, instead of you. Yeah, thank God it's yeah. them instead of us. Um, I mean, these are uh, formative kinds of ideas that can imprint quite deeply and it ties into what you're saying about, you know, parents and the home being you know the first kind of school of courage depending on what children hear the stories they hear growing up the examples of bravery and courage and resilience um but how do we make that real for people where they think well you know what i'm not omar ibn khattab i'm not hamza ibn abdul muttalib i'm you know not on a battlefield i'm just plodding along trying to do my exams and listen to my parents or i'm trying to get married and you know how do we bring those ideas it filtered effectively down to acts of courage that we can, as believers. Well, first of all, we have to have hope, right? Because most people say, yeah, I'm not those, I'm not those, I'm not those, and which is true, we're not. And the Prophet some sit, imagine sitting with his companions one day and he says, I miss them. And they say, who, who are these people that you miss? To paraphrase. And he says, my brothers. And uh, they say, are we not your brothers? He said, no, you're my companions. My brothers are those who will follow me, but will never, never have seen me. Mm. That's us. So we've got hope. And part of that hope is, okay, yes, we can't be like them, but we certainly aspire to follow in their footsteps. There are always examples, contemporary examples of people in our lifetime or in recent times who did uh, amazing uh, fates of achievement against the greatest of odds. Recently, I was looking at the life of uh, Abdul Karim al Khattabi, who in 1925 defeated the largest uh, colonial occupation force in history, mm -hmm. an army of uh, 20,000 Spanish troops in Morocco. Yet most of us don't know, have never heard of him. This and was the Battle of the Ridge? It's, it's, so this is called the Battle of um, uh, uh, Anual. Yes. In, so this is in Morocco. Most people have never heard of it, uh, even in Morocco. Um, few people have heard of it, or fewer people have heard of it than should. Now, these, if, if this was a Western example of, there'd be, not, not that we would do this, but statues, uh, accolades, um, annual remembrances, yeah, and so memorials. forth. So we have characters throughout our history, even in modern history, um, who we should look up to. Role models, people who've stood up against um, the odds and paid the price. Uh, and I think that that's something we do need to teach our children and to let them learn their stories, whether it's through reading or whether it's through research, whether it's through, through film, uh, whether it's through, through a podcast. Yes. What is stopping us then? Do we simply not know these people? Are, are their stories never given platforms? Are we, our, are we ourselves as, you know, the, the caregivers or the educators just simply ignorant of our own history. I, I think this time, at this time in, in, mm -hmm. in, in history, we are more culpable than ever those before in the past because we have everything at our fingertips. Uh, whenever you want something, mm -hmm. it'll come through as, a, as an algorithm or onto a feed into your, whichever social media you, you follow yes. based upon what you want to know. So if you we want create. to know about something, mm -hmm. it'll come to you eventually. Um, and if you don't, you won't see it. You, you won't find it. And of course, the other thing is that actively researching something, mm -hmm. looking for, just type in modern day Muslim heroes to follow for my children. Mm -hmm. and just literally type that sentence in and you'll get, you'll, you'll get a response. Now, if you're not doing that, it means it's not a priority for you. Yes. Uh, and so, as I said, we have plenty of examples for us ourselves and we need to do it from early days because after all, let will be frank, that if, if, if our children will know more about uh, every possible child cartoon there yes. is that has nothing to do with Islam, which mm -hmm. is fine, let mm -hmm. them do that. Mm -hmm. But they'll have, in, com in comparison, there'll be no examples or barely any examples, maybe a couple of Sahabi, Sahaba, but then that's it, nothing com contemporary. It's not just not having the examples, it's the fact that, you know, whether you're watching Bluey or you're watching, uh, you know, any any of the uh, prog uh, programs that come uh, for children, they are really slickly produced, they're beautifully mm. scripted, they're wonderfully yeah. kind of presented. You, you, you can't compete with them. You, you can't. I mean, this is an industry that you literally have child psychologists sat down and they're looking at what kind of colours of a certain cartoon character's yeah. top is going to attract, like, children. But you know, there's one 
one thing that stands the test of time with all children and that is storytelling mm. sitting down bedtime you know there's no screens on there's nothing mm. sitting down and telling them a story good old fashioned and yeah, nothing beats that mm. Uh, and uh, so that's still in our hands. And you have to be an engaging storyteller, though, right? You do. You do. You, yes. you can't be boring can't be old boring. dad. No, no, you can't. No. You have to be creative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, as in, this is a kind of a a weight of responsibility yeah. that that carries. And when it comes to actually Muslims, I'm, I'm, you know, thinking about courage as being innate within the character of the believer, in so much as if you go back right back to the time of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Um, when he, with respect, you know, questioned his father about his carving of idols and actually dared to speak what was on his mind and challenge the fact that, you know, this doesn't make sense and I don't understand. And though all of society is going along with, you know, what what you're doing and they all believe a certain thing, giving ourselves permission to actually question seems to be a massive barrier for many Muslims today. So can you speak to me a bit about what you've observed about intellectual courage specifically? I mean, just you just quote the, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. There's, uh, when he leaves his wife Hajar mm. and Ismail behind, in you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as, as wadi ghayri the zir'in, that this is a place where nothing grows, yes. right? And he's going. Yes. And she says, what, what would the response of any person be at that point? A woman with a child would be, where are you going? What's happening? But her response is, Am Allah amaraka bihada. Did Allah order you to do this? And he just nods. And then he goes. Imagine the courage of that woman to say, I'm going to be left in this place. I mean, these, uh, she knows she's married to a prophet mm. and everything that's mm. coming directly mm. from Allah subhanahu mm-hmm. wa ta'ala. But still, she's still a human being and she has a child there. And, and her courage is, you know, I will leave this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because she says to him, in Allah la yudaik, Allah will not waste you or us. And so, so these type of examples for us in modern days, okay, again, we're not required. We're not required mm-hmm. to make that kind of sacrifice. Yes. But at least to understand that sometimes that's what we need to teach, teach our children this. And then if and a time may come, we, we're in the West, especially in, in, in the UK, we're amongst the top 5% privileged in the world. And yes, the problems yes. we have are first world problems, yes, no absolutely. matter where we originate mm-hmm, from. Mm-hmm. This t- so part of that is recognizing that we may at some point get tested with our health, with our wealth, with loss. Allah says it again and again in the mm-hmm. Quran, we're going to test you with something mm-hmm. uh, um, of loss. And when that thing comes, how do you deal with it? And how you deal with it is what reverberates around you. If you deal with it, anger, um, uncontrollable sorrow, Mm -hmm. unable to function, then that means you, what you've done then is said, this this dunya, this life is the most important. Mm -hmm. And you're not behaving as if this life is temporal when you you know that it is. Mm Um, and I think that that's what we as a, because what did the Prophet ﷺ say in the hadith? He said the nations will gather to, to take feast, to yeah. feast from yes, you yes. as they do, as, as animals do. Mm-hmm. And the Sahaba replied, "Amin nahnu ya Rasulullah." We will be few in number because mm-hmm. that's the only way mm-hmm. they understood mm-hmm. that they could yeah, be yeah. you know what? humiliated yeah. in that way. He said, "No, but your hearts will have a wahan." wahan, and they said, "What's mal wahan ya Rasulullah? Hubbud dunya." Mm. Love of life, hatred of dying. And so if we live our life thinking that's it, this we do everything to make sure that we get the most in this life and no preparation for the akhirah. And in the end, when it the hardest test, which is loss of life, comes, yes. look how people react. Yes. And it's making our preparation, it's making our, our, our life's preparation for that ultimate meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scenario you just described with, you know, imagine like the scene in the desert and Hajar with her young child and Ibrahim alayhi salam being forced to leave them there and, uh, you know, effectively just turn his back and walk away. It's a kind of dual kind of demonstrations of courage, right? Of the, the, the courage, you know, a, a man to leave his course, wife and dependent child and the, the woman herself to say, I trust that this is from Allah, so it yeah. can only be good. And of course, Ibrahim is repeatedly tested, isn't he? Yes. Like you said, that, um, uh, and, and it's so it's 
our knowledge that alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't testing us in that way directly. Yes. But we know of people who've been tested terribly. Yes. Te- absolutely terribly. I, I know so, so many stories of so many people and I constantly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he didn't put me through this. Yes. In, uh, you know, but really getting tested in the way of some of the prisoners we advocate for 21 years no charge or trial coming home to meet a 20 year old daughter you've never met in your life your father or your mother or your child dying while you're in prison held without charge or trial i mean these are some of the uh, success stories i I call them Mm. success stories because at the end of it there's a release and a person is is freed from that um and then they're seeing some of these people and seeing how they respond. I remember there's one brother, uh, he's, he's Syrian, he was resettled to Uruguay of all places oh, yeah. from Guantanamo. He wanted to see his son when he was, uh, uh, before he was released, but that was the time of the Arab Spring and mm. the, the family was trying to get out of Syria. His son uh, was killed. And he was, he, the last time he saw him was three years old. The son died when he was 16. And when I said to him, uh, I want to give my condolences, he said, what are you talking about? He said, I believe my son Shaheed. Why should I be upset? If I'm a Muslim and I believe that inshallah is in the highest ranks of Jannah as a Shaheed, why should I be upset? Re- do you tell me, unless I don't believe in everything that I've been told throughout my, my this life. This is it though, isn't it? Because in all the examples that you're giving, there's a real like um, a bonded relationship between courage and truth. If your courage is rooted in the idea that there's an ultimate truth and a reality by which you're living your life, the akhirah is true, dunya is true for the purpose that it's meant to serve, and your soul is true and the purpose of your soul is true, then courage is just a vehicle in which to realize that truth, essentially. Yeah. So do you think conversely, kind of a lack of courage is tied to a kind of shaky sense of tawakkul or a shaky sense of, um, you know, you, you mentioned the hadith about the wahan and, and the love of the dunya. Where do you think for us today, our, you know, the, the lack of courage comes from? What are the sources of that? Um, well, we do see acts of courage every day sometimes, they are, whether it's a, you know, a, a child giving up his kidney for his parent, for example, mm-hmm. who's suffering from uh, loss of the ability to use a kidney, or whatever it is. You see those acts all the time, and they're selfless. They're really selfless acts because they do take people donating blood, perhaps to a lesser extent. But all of these things, these are selfless acts that happen on a daily basis. But really things that change. Mm-hmm. It, that is it. I mean, the main thing, and, and again, I refer back to that hadith about Hamza, is how do you even change a situation, especially against oppression? Mm-hmm. Because that's where, you know, that's where the the kind of the struggle yes. between what's right and wrong happened. The, yeah. To do it despite, to do that act despite the fear that that you're going to. F- um, so fear is still present. Fear is always cora- present. Yeah. In the courageous yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one example is uh, I remember you know in in. In, uh, I gave the example of, of my prayer in, in American custody, the first prayer. Mm. And it isn't because I was courageous, it's the guy next to me. Mm. So he, you know, we're sit- seated down in, in this, on this plane, I've told this story a few times. And, and it, so an American soldier puts a, a knife to my neck, but this person over, he doesn't care. He doesn't care what they're going to do. To him, what's the most important thing? He's surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's going to pray, it doesn't matter what they threaten him, whether they tie his hands behind his back and hood him, and as they done, did to us, mm-hmm. he's going to pray. Uh, in Bagram and in, uh, even in uh, Kandahar prison, I saw soldiers storm in and tell brothers while they're praying, break your prayer. Some brothers did, mm. some carried on, mm. and the soldiers came in and put their boots on their head, and they still carried on. So it's, it's all down to your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that breaks his prayer is not less of a Muslim, yeah. It's just that there's a different connection here between it's he, as far as he's concerned, he's now in a state of, of direct communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No and you'll have to physically really hurt him to make that, to break that. And sometimes just for me to to see those things, I know they're not ordinary uh, people haven't don't ordinarily see yes, this stuff. Yeah. But it has a lasting effect. 
And well, I mean, you could uh, sitting like in your living room in London or Birmingham and time for Salah comes in, it could never cross your mind to, you know, delay it till the last moment after you've witnessed what you've witnessed. Well, I mean, I mean it do, of course it does. It, it does. I mean, sometimes it happens all. And I'm mm. not an angel mm. and, and mm. nobody who's seen that stuff is. Mm. But it reminds you. Sometimes mm. it's a reminder to yourself, mm. Muslim, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you remember that time? You know, and and also when I tell people about it, they they have the same reaction. Yeah. What excuse do we have? But all of these, I, I don't even know if that's an act of courage. I think that's when it's it's transcended beyond anything. It's just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your your connection is so strong that nothing else matters. And I, I think you can take somebody uh, like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, mm. uh, old, weak, and cries easily. But he's that type of person. The courage he has is, is immeasurable in that sense of when they try to attack him. And the first thing he says, is the Prophet okay? Yes. You know? Yes. Well, I have to tell you, I've seen footage, um, you know, literally video, kind of shaky video recordings of, um, you know, a, a village in Afghanistan where, you know, these young Soviet troops during the 80s are about to storm in. And you literally have men in their 80s, in their 90s, with their kind of, you know, dusty, like, kameez and mm. uh, picking up, a, you know, old, like, AK-47. And they're literally sat on the truck ready to die. They yeah. can barely walk, but they're ready ready to die and this is something that you know it, it really makes you think is the source of this is is it just this instinctive kind of fitri inclination that gets ignited when you feel like you're about to be you know attacked and and you can't come to life is there something in the spiritual dna of people well th there's definitely a collective memory you know if you Af yes. the afghans are, are a brilliant example of that because you can go back hundreds of years and actually see that repeatedly you know I, i've seen them picking up 303 lee enfield rifles from world war one yes and, yes. and carrying the them Anglo and Afghan walking Wars. in yep. towards where everybody's <laughs> evacuating yes. from yes and uh, you know they call i think they call them the spingira the, the the white beards yes spingira, and yeah. and uh, you think where does this come from are they being courageous or is this yeah normal for them yes and yes. i would argue it, a bit of both but it is quite normal for them but this normative kind of it's almost like a contagion isn't it like yeah. socially where kind of if if your cultural identity your selfhood is tied in your kind of integrity as an independent kind of um warrior for your homeland where like you know Afghanistan was never colonized. It can't be colonized, you know. Mm -hmm. in, in India, like a couple of countries down, yes, can be under colonization. Indeed. But the, the, the Afghans would, you know, never. You know, in Bagram, I remember I was with a prisoner. His name was Sharif. He had one eye. And we were together. And we used to have whispered conversations because we weren't allowed to talk. So we had to kind of pretend and put our hands over our mouth and speak like that. And me and Sharif got close he was a good a good English speaker spoke Arabic fluently also and one day he had an altercation with uh, some of the American guards and he looked at them and he said you know my father was buried alive outside just outside Bagram where we're held he was buried alive in a mass grave by the Soviets he said his son is here now in a building built by those Soviets mm -hmm. taken over by you he said do you think he's gonna bow down to you the Americans I and mean, what a what a conversation that was! What a word! There was no no it's response they could give to. Him. Yeah. yeah. What do you say? Yeah. What do you say? In and he was totally to right. His yeah. son and his country didn't bow down to them, and that was the whole point, is that the, what you have here not not that. See, the price the Afghans have had to pay has been enormous. Of course, of course. It's, it's and, and there's a risk here of romanticizing yeah, kind yeah. of acts of courage where actually, you know, as a country in all out famine and with I incredible yeah. economic yeah. like de deprivation, you know, it, th the cost of courage is very, very grave. Yeah. And uh, this is also a lot of our discourse as Muslims sometimes. It is in, you know, we have these ISOC talks, Battle of Badr and Battle of Uhud, and we all mm -hmm. sit with our kind of Starbucks coffees, just like starry-eyed about the past and just go back to our comfortable yeah. lives. But um, actually the, the reality of courage is not rosy. No, no, it's not. Um, and I, I talk about this stuff mostly because I've seen it with yes. my eyes. Um, and it isn't, it's, it's actually extremely scary. Yes. I remember when I went to Bosnia during the war that time and, and you know, I joined up with the, with the Mujahideen for a period of time 
the first place they took me to was the hospital. And there I saw a British brother who had his eye shot out. And he was like in his teens, you know, and uh, some of this stuff kind of shocks you, the, 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 mm. the, the reality of the horror of war. Yes. And war is horrific. Yes. And for a nation to have sustained that uh, for four decades of war from the most powerful nations in the world, the yes. greatest superpowers, yeah. for them to have taken that on, uh, and to have, you know, there's a, probably they've got too much courage, if anything. Mm -hmm. They've got, I mean, I've, I need to be pragmatic with that courage. I, I, can, I mean, this stories I could tell you will mm. be here forever, but there is, it's, you're no longer afraid of bullets. Yeah. Literally, you're not afraid of bullets. It's famous among some of, some of the Afghans that when they fight is that if you were seen to be ducking and mm. hiding and running, it was like a, from bullets. It, it's almost yeah, seen as bubbles. cowardice. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's to the level of now, you're yeah. so used to that now, yeah. and, and there needs to be a scaling back from that. But mm. we can learn a lot from them, a lot. In fact, the entire Muslim world can learn something about, if you look at Palestine, if you look at all the other places where there's occupation for yeah. years on end, and people have tried various processes, whether it's in the Arab Spring and the democratic process and so forth, and in the end, it's an entire failure. Mm. And somewhere else, it's just a question of being true to your belief and being patient and staying the course. And I think that is, is one of the lessons for us as Muslims is we, we, because we're in the West, we're so affected by it, we want instant gratification. Yes. And preparing for a long-term personal struggle and, and one for society and for ourselves is, is, is not easy because we have to teach that to our kids. We do, but it's a, a question, what's the price we have to pay? for courage must we be willing to lose our lives lose our children lose our home lose our everything what what ultimately you know if you were to say to the average person the average muslim like for you to be courageous you have to be willing to just step away this selflessness you're talking you about. have to be you have to be willing for loss allah subhanahu wa says am hasibtum an tadkhulul jannah do you think you're enter jannah and you will not be tested the way people were, before you were tested. They were touched with harm and, and hardship until the earth underneath their feet shook. And the Prophet uh, and, and those who believed with him uh, said, Mata Nasrullah. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet himself is shaken. Yes, the yes. believers with him are shaken and they're saying, When is the help of Allah coming? And, and Allah replies, Allah inna Nasrullah qareeb. You, you know that verse when when somebody dies, right? What do we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. But that verse has nothing to do necessarily only with death, mm. right? Because Allah says, "Wana nablu wana kum bi shayin min al khuf." We're going to test you with fear, wal jur and hunger, wa naqsi min al amwal wa al anfusi wa al thamarat, and loss of wealth and property and goods and food and life. And then it says. And those who are tested with an affliction say, Inna lillahi wa inna rajiun. Right, so it's all of that's the context of the one when we say that. Yes. So we have to be prepared as an ummah. That's what the, the Quran is filled with verses. I've just given you two. It's filled with verses about that. But that preparation, though, it's also something that you have to be prepared for the dunyawi results to never occur the way that you yeah. hope they would, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. How the martyrs of of God going centuries back, right? Where some person, a, a person's individual struggle and sacrifice will be their soul's salvation, but that doesn't necessarily translate as material results on the ground not for no, the cause all. that they were fighting and for. And that's not in our hands, really. That's yeah. ours is just to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do. And victory and, and success, rather, uh, will come whenever he decides and however he decides. Uh, but our... It, it all got, goes back down to what's our purpose in this life. Mm -hmm. If we think, and, and, and I do again feel that we've got a very Western, even though we're yeah. a very Western look on it. If you yeah. look at people in, in the majority, I read a, a, a statistic recently that said that Arabs are 5% uh, of the world's population, but they are about 45% of the world's refugees. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, so imagine we were having a conversation with somebody from that background mm. and so, I know I've come across many of them in Syria, Egypt, 
resignation to fate sometimes. It's just, yes, you know, this yes. is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. And so, I mean, yeah, again, I thank Allah that we're not being tested in that way and that we are in a position that we can talk about it and philosophize, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. philosophize about mm -hmm. it. But in the end, if you, if you're, those people are already living it. Yes, you don't have yes, to have, have a choice. conversation about yes, yes, are you yes, doing it or not. Yes, it's, it's, yes. That's what they're dealing with. And we've just making our connection with such people is yeah. really important. And mm. sometimes we can become desensitized by saying, oh, well, the best way to, we can do is charity and so forth. But, you know, people who go out to those places for a little while, aid workers, charity workers and so forth and come back, they often have a different perspective of life and different understanding. And one of those is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could test you at any point. And are you prepared for that test? Have you have you internally preferred yourself for that test? Um, and I think that, that we're constantly telling ourselves that it's not going to be me. Well, this is it. And what would you what would you say for someone who said, you know what, Mazen, this is just like too much of a tall order. I don't see why as a Muslim, I need to be prepared to lose my life, my death, my children, my wealth, my everything. Why can't I just, you know, go to school, get a good job, love my family, you know, go out to eat, have fun, believe in Allah, worship him, do my fara'id. And, uh, you know, w what's the need for all of this? Well, that's the difference, you see. That's the difference. Uh, that's the difference between um, somebody who makes a difference and somebody who doesn't. You know, if we gave uh, examples of people in modern times, Malcolm X is one of them, right? Yes. He comes, he learns from it. He is from a life of the dunya where he chases every aspect of the dunya. Mm -hmm. He's known as Satan in prison yes. because of his love of the dunya and his uh, disregard for anything to do with religion because religion essentially is going to take him away from that. Yes. And he makes a change. And he comes to a point in which he recognizes that speaking a word of truth against the evil that's happening in his society is going to be. He said, you know, before he was taken, I'm a dead man walking. I know he I'm going to get he killed. Yeah, I know I'm going to. Yeah. So now you've resigned yourself. But what did he stop? Did he stop his message because life was at threat? They firebombed his house. Did he stop? And that's that's the point. Why didn't he stop? He was threatened, right? With, with, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And there were plots to kill him and so forth. He knew he was being monitored, all of that. He did. But he didn't stop. And look at his legacy today. His legacy is so powerful that it continues 60 on years on, the richness, yeah. people are talking about him in, in places where they've never seen a black man before. Do we have to all be Malcolm X? Are we going to have an Ummah or well, you see, the a thing billion is, Malcolm X? We're going to go back again now. Do we have to be Ibrahim alayhi salam? Mm. Do we have to be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Do we have to be Abu Bakr? Do we have to be, we're going to keep saying, do we have- Who do we have to we, be? We have to be ourselves, but aspire to be like them. We have to be ourselves, but aspire to be like them. Because after all, the examples given to us in the Quran, in the Sunnah, are all of these people, right? And then we get modern day examples that every now and then occur, and they are rare. They're very rare. But they're rare because of the state of how we've become as people. What has we're kind of a reflection of, of, of people we produce. Yes, we are. This kind of internal stagnation, spiritual or personal within us, has led to this, which actually is, is my next question to you. What price do you think we have paid as an ummah today for the lack of courage? Um, mass disunity. Uh, we've literally, I don't like to use the word, but almost prostitute ourselves as, as an ummah uh, to people who don't have our best interests at heart. Uh, we, I think the, the part of us being so able and ready to turn upon one another is one of the most destructive things. And it's as a result of who has more. Who so gets it's greed. More. It's, it's really, yeah, it's yeah, it is. You know, there's. A, I think there's the, this this hadith. Uh, I can't remember the exact of it, but it, is that whoever takes, you know, in a battle, mm -hmm. and they used to take war booty and the so booty, forth. Yeah. Whoever takes a portion of his war booty in this life mm. will lose its reward in the next life, and so that's that's your right. It's your hak to do it, but why? So that you have your connection. You're not doing this for the sake of the people or for the dunya. You know that, that uh, it says, la shukura. We feed you and we help you for the sake of Allah. We don't want anything from this dunya. We want to do it to connect us to it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what connects us to the ummah. That we're doing it because we love our brothers and sisters. 
not for worldly gain, though they may some some of it may come. And I think the cost of it has been part of that. And and perhaps if there's anything worse, it's our identity. In the end, we have become not all of us. Of course, there's a revival, but we start to follow aspects of of un-Islamic um, discourse, and we start to question Islam through that discourse. And yes, as a result yes. of it, we start to doubt and throw doubts. And yes. sh- and, and so when we, we do that, we lose our connection and we start to undermine our faith to every aspect, whether it's the, the metaphysical or the physical. And that's deeply dangerous. It is this disconnect that you're kind of alluding to something that, for me, it really came to the fore. On a certain day, I was reading... Um, you know the final words spoken by Khalid ibn Walid as he was passing away on his deathbed, yes. where he literally said, there's not an inch of my body that's not covered in battle wounds and scars, yet I lie here like I spent my life begging Allah for martyrdom and here I am. And you know, he, he said the famous line, may the eyes of cowards never sleep. I remember reading that passage and kind of, you know where it takes you spiritually, mm, mentally, yeah. was on another plane. Yeah. And five minutes later, I was having a conversation with a friend who said that she had to go on a um, course for three weeks in order to learn how to make eye contact with somebody in an interview setting because she was just so, unsure of herself and so kind of you know unable to the self-confidence the self-esteem the self you know image and um it took her three weeks to learn how to maintain eye contact and i just remember coming away from that conversation with my head kind of spinning thinking what just happened like look at our history look at the state we were in and look at us now you know and of course there's a million reasons why people have their own you know issues internally and things but this kind of um you know forget courage like we seem to have stagnated to the bare basics of functioning sometimes where you know like you're saying we give like our um our identity is very much a liberal, Western, almost secularized identity with like an Islamic veneer. Exactly, uh, absolutely, absolutely. It is. And and uh, I fear that Islam now has become something very much of a veneer. Yeah. It it's you know there's a verse again. I, I make often references because this is how I think. Mm. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, and tawallu wujukum qibla al mashriq wal maghrib." That goodness isn't whether you face east yes, or west. It's not yes. about the. It's not about the looking of it. It's about yeah. and and. Uh, the, it goes on to describe your beliefs, mm-hmm. but then that you spend from that which you love, and that you give, and that was sabirina fil wa bas. Look at that. That they are patient on hardships and difficulties, and wherever those difficulties are, Those are the truthful, and those are the ones who have fear of Allah. You know, I, I was just thinking that <coughs> you mentioned about Khalid bin Walid. You know, he, and he says that f- the, those famous words. That the eyes of the cowards never yes. be, you know, uh, pleased, sleep. Yes. And but then somebody responds to him and says, "But you see, you were the sword of Allah. Mm. That was the name given to you so <coughs> by the Prophet Sallallahu You could never have died in battle, and that's why you've got all of these bodies. You've been hit by every sword <coughs> every sword, every uh, spearhead, mm. arrowhead. You, not one part of your body, but you couldn't break in battle. And I thought, look at the, look at what does that teach us as yes. ummah." That message alone is that uh, he's sad, but look at the powerful message that comes out of it. He's literally, and, yeah. we are instruments of Allah. Yeah, exactly. And, he, and yeah. to conclude, Mahazam, <coughs> give me, give me your top insider tips on the practical ways all of us can inculcate courage and if we feel courageous to increase in courage, if we don't have courage to, to get to a level that's acceptable. I don't know, I'm not an expert in courage. My, my only thing I can say about that is look at people. Look at people and you will be able to distinguish between those that are courageous and those that are not. Uh, and surround yourself by those people. If they're few in number, then let it be so. And uh, courage is contagious, as is cowardice. So make sure that you're with the former and not the latter. You're on the dean of your friends. Right. With that, Moazam, I'd like to say a very heartfelt thank you. Jazakallah khair for joining us today. Marakallah, Fik, my pleasure. And inshallah, I hope to have you on many times again in future. Inshallah. About different aspects. From all of us at Narrative House, that was the in-house podcast. Assalamu alaikum and until next time.